to our Justice Town Hall. We know this crisis is hitting everyone and in so many different ways. Uh, as you can see, so many families at home uh, having lost their job, uh, small businesses getting hit pretty hard. Uh, when I had my law firm for 15 years, I had to make a payroll twice a month, so I know uh, what many of you are going through right now. We're going to talk about some of that relief. Uh, we're going to think about our first responders and what they're facing every day, and of course, uh, those uh, who got COVID-19 and uh, families who are, who are um, uh, grappling with this uh, national pandemic. Uh, I wanted to take a few minutes to be able to speak with uh, our allies at AAJ, FJA, and CFATL, knowing that a lot of justice issues uh, are coming up and will uh, soon face us very quickly. So I uh, wanted to get your input and, and hear from everybody. We're uh, joined by Bonnie Johnston of AAJ, who will give an update in a little bit. Paul Jess from FJA, thanks for being on the line. And Jeremiah Jaspon, one of our local attorneys and longtime friend from CFATL, thanks for being on the line. So I'm going to go over briefly some of the CARES provisions and some of the liability issues and, uh, and scams that have come up. And then I'm going to um, pass it over to our uh, guests to talk about some of the issues in more detail that they may be seeing, particularly uh, with regard to justice issues. Uh, we know with this unprecedented, nearly unprecedented crisis, since we haven't had a pandemic this size since 1918, that uh, Congress it recognized that. We stepped up with the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, uh, the CARES Act, which is a $2.2 trillion uh, response and relief uh, package, the biggest in the history of the Congress, recognizing how uh, how our economy has been grinded to a halt and how deadly the COVID-19 uh, virus can be. Uh, includes $1,200 uh, for most Americans, uh, plus $500 uh, per child. That's for folks making $75,000 a year or less. Uh, for folks making between seventy-five dollars and $99,000 a year, uh, you'll receive uh, smaller checks. And uh, of course, we've started to see those uh, checks go out primarily to Social Security beneficiaries and Supplemental Security Income beneficiaries. Uh, who had direct deposit. The good news is 99% of them do. So uh, 88 million uh, Americans have received those, uh, those direct deposits already. We'll start seeing by the end of this week, um, most taxpayers start uh, in round by round receiving those checks. Strongly urge everyone to uh, apply for direct deposit. Uh, if you don't already have that on uh, line with the IRS, uh, for, there's many reasons. Uh, you know, when I was a small business person, I'd always owe at the end of the year, so there was no tax refund coming in. So if you if you didn't get a refund, which may happen for a lot of folks, you're obviously going to have to uh, register. And that's with the Get My Payment app. Uh, again, that's the Get My Payment app. And a lot of your clients will probably have questions about that too. Uh, we've heard a lot of improvements and feedback from constituents this week, from last week, about glitches that are being fixed. With, uh, with this IRS portal to not only request a direct deposit, but it also can help you track your payment. Uh, for those of you, there's, there's some frequently caused delays of this payment too that you should be aware of for you and your clients. Uh, some financial institutions, uh, they may receive it, but have not processed the payment yet. That could be a one to three day delay uh, as they're processing those payments. Others who use tax preparers, such as H&R Block, TurboTax, or those of you who do tax law or, or are lawyers slash accountants, um, many folks, uh, many of these tax preparers use a direct deposit account that they've set up for their clients, and that's where the payment will go. Uh, so if you use a tax preparer, and I know a lot of small businesses, including myself, have used those in the past, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you contact them to have access to that account. Some folks have old bank accounts listed with the IRS since these incomes are based on 2018 to 2019 tax returns. Folks who got their tax return for 2018 um, may not even use that bank account anymore. So you're gonna to wanna to update those bank accounts. Um, and finally, for as I mentioned, for those who have owed taxes before or who just didn't have any, oblig didn't have any tax obligation and uh, didn't have a refund, you definitely wanna to go to the Get My Payment app uh, and register. If so, you should have 
uh, an ability to receive your check in May. It was Congress's intent to send those out in April and May. Uh, if not, it'll be weeks after that before folks will get a check in the mail. And it'll go from the poorest Americans at uh, 50, I believe, no, excuse me, 5 million taxpayers a week until everybody's paid. So definitely sign up on that Get My Payment app. Uh, one, another important issue that may come up for uh, your clients is uh, once the payment's sent, we put in a fail safe in the CARES Act that the IRS has to send a notice of payment within 15 days after sending the payment. And that has to include the method by which the payment was made, the amount of the payment, and a phone number for an appropriate point of contact at the IRS to report any failure to receive the money. That, of course, be sent by U.S. mail. Uh, so for folks who just can't find uh, where their payment went uh, and can't seem to track it on the Get My Payment app, you'll get a key point of contact. Right now, our congressional office has a point of contact, but they're even pretty slow because they're obviously overwhelmed. So for, for clients who are looking out for this check, and hadn't received it and they get that notice, um, that'll be a key point of contact that you could call directly with the IRS to help them uh, secure their payment if they, they have it. Another issue that's come up uh, that we're still waiting on IRS uh, guidance on is seamless checks to, who are re received by spouses whose, uh, whose spouse has passed. Uh, there is no guidance yet. So I think uh, the smart move would be to advise clients to uh, not spend that money that went to the decedent uh, and uh, hold off until we get advice. I really think this advice should have happened already, but unfortunately it hasn't. Uh, some justice issues that have come up. First, uh, scams. There are people calling up, uh, pretending to be the IRS or the Social Security Administration, particularly preying on uh, our seniors. And uh, uh, you all know this already, having worked with unfair trade practice issues and other things that there's no, the IRS never call, rarely calls up taxpayers anyway, unless there's an open case. Uh, and they never ask for your social security number or other personal information. Uh, and they certainly wouldn't be calling up anybody for this stimulus payment. So uh, for your elderly clients and those of you who practice elder law and trust law, that's a real key thing to look out for. Another justice issue that'll be a big fight going into CARES too is mixed families with citizens married to immigrants do not qualify, not even the U.S. citizen qualify for a stimulus check. It's outrageous uh, that this is happening. And we have a lot of veterans who are married to immigrants. It's not uncommon for veterans to, to serve our country abroad and marry uh, someone from a foreign country and come back. That's a very common occurrence. Uh, so it's been a real, uh, uh, real terrible injustice to see veterans who serve our country not eligible for these seamless che checks because they're married to an immigrant. Uh, that'll be an issue that'll come up in, uh, in CARES too, but there may also be uh, justice issues for the courts uh, on that. I haven't seen any, I'm, give, I'm gonna give you updates on lawsuits and some of these things. I haven't seen any lawsuits on that particular item yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we, uh, we saw an equal protection argument uh, for uh, citizens not eligible because they're married uh, to an immigrant. Of course, if you have a social security number, you're eligible for a check. So there are some dreamers, DACA recipients, who, because they have DACA, they can apply for a social security number. If they have, then they can qualify for a check. In addition, there are some long-term work visa workers who can apply for a social security number. So there's a rare select group of immigrants who can still get these checks. Next, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the federal unemployment benefits uh, that were in the act. As you may know, it's $600 per week for up to four months. Uh, it applies in a, to a much broader uh, group of workers. It applies to employees who've lost their job, employees who've lost hours, uh, and to independent contractors and self-employed folks, uh, which normally wouldn't qualify, those group, that group wouldn't qualify for the state benefit. And uh, those folks, uh, those independent contractors, may also qualify for up to $275 per week in a federal benefit based upon uh, the income or, or wages lost. Uh, under the CARES Act, which was kind of an obscure provision until it came up the other day, uh, because 
it provides for an equal state benefit on the federal level for states that disqualify certain workers that qualify under the CARES Act. So they can qualify for up to $875. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the state website has been a disaster. Uh, we all know that. I'm sure you all are banging your heads against the wall talking to clients um, who are applying. Uh, we gave them $29 million to help get their act together from the U.S. Department of Labor about three weeks ago. They've used this money and other funding to get 72 new servers. There are new paper applications for those who are at their wits end. Uh, although Secretary Satter has uh, stated he still thinks those are going to be the slowest ones processed, so it may give you peace of mind, but it still may ultimately be a slower way. There's three new call senders uh, to help answer their call volume. Of course, there was a shutdown this weekend. Uh, an attempt to repair the website. Um, just going back a little bit for those of you, uh, and I see some of the folks I work with quite a bit in the state legislature, like Paul Jess and, and Jeff Porter on the line. Uh, this is a 1990s, 1980s set of computers and systems that then you, they layered on new technology. Uh, so it really, they just need to build a whole new system. But until then, or there's all these patches. Um, the unemployment eligibility for independent contractors, that application just went online this past Wednesday, so uh, a little less than a week ago. Because of that, the state is going to allow for retroactive benefits as of March 9th um, because they there was a delayed rollout. For, so for those independent contractors, those uh, working in the gig economy, and this includes everyone from your Uber and Lyft drivers to uh, uh, barbers and hairdressers, uh, to any number of consultants and, and any other kind of 1099 work being, being done. So that'll be important to seek those retroactive benefits to March 9th. That'll be a big help to some folks. Uh, in addition, there's retroactivity for everyone as of the date of their application, regardless if it's the state benefit or the federal benefit, uh, but there is no retroactivity as of the date of the job loss, which is what we were hoping would happen. So that should give people more time. Um, the governor and the administration hasn't been super clear on how people are gonna improve that. So I suspect there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of fights over when you first applied. So for any of your clients, um, if, whether the, anything they could do to preserve any evidence of when they first applied is gonna be key uh, for seeking those. Uh, they waive the biweekly job search requirement, uh, but that waiver is, and it applies to everyone. Um, but that waiver is coming up on a deadline of May 2nd, so we'll see whether they continue that. And I should mention, uh, so as of today, there were 835,000 confirmed unique cases. You see numbers like 2 million claims. Many of those are duplicative because people in their great frustration applied in several different ways. So 835,000 unique confirmed claims, 674,000 claims have been processed and 404,000 claims have been paid. Um, the news this weekend was that 166,000 claims were rejected and I'm sure that's higher today. There's a new DEO dashboard that uh, for those of you who are looking statewide, particularly those of you who serve on the boards of uh, a lot of these esteemed organizations, uh, if you want to track, uh, it really helps. Um, and uh, we, uh, we suspect some people were wrongfully denied, whether they, uh, uh, they filled out the application wrong. We suspect a lot of folks who were independent contractors who applied before the application went live last week may also have been denied. Uh, so uh, definitely worth it to reapply. We're taking on some of those cases, um, but most of that still goes through state jurisdiction through our state legislators. Uh, and, uh, so those are gonna be big issues. Obviously big justice issues coming up that many of you may already have been following. There's several class action suits that have been filed um, over the last week or two uh, regarding this, um, this terrible uh, unemployment system. Uh, I believe attorneys Mary uh, Maddox and Gaudier Kitchen of Tallahassee filed a class action suit, uh, I wanna say last week. I saw another one coming out of Brevard County, and I wasn't sure if there was another one coming out of um, the, Bay, the Tampa Bay area too, but, uh, but I'm sure a lot of folks um, will be filing these suits regionally and they might get all consolidated. Those are um, 
there are better attorneys on the line than me who will probably know the better answer to that. Um, the grounds of negligence, possibly intentional torts for creating a flawed website uh, seven years ago that led to uh, uh, a meltdown of the system uh, that forced, uh, that produced joblessness that uh, exceed the record of the Great Recession and how they knew uh, that there were problems there and they refused to fix them. There was a report as recently as 2019 um, by the inspector, by one of our inspector general offices uh, that there, these issues were there. So there is some really damning evidence out there, um, not only from during the time under Governor Scott, but under now Governor DeSantis from state officials warning uh, that there was an issue. So it'll be interesting following those cases. Um, small business loans. I know so many of you uh, are figuring out how you're going to pay your employees, pay rent, uh, pay utilities. And, uh, and Jeremiah and I were just talking about how the phone is uh, not ringing as much for new cases right now, although I suspect uh, we'll see uh, some changes on that. I look forward to that perspective in a few minutes. Uh, so we passed the $367 billion in small business loans, uh, and particularly the very popular Paycheck Protection Act uh, that had $349 billion, uh, and it got tapped out in 11 days. Now, the key is we did want to get this quickly out into the street, uh, if you keep 100% of your employees, you get 100% of two and a half months of payroll loans forgiven, uh, which is an incredible deal, obviously. And, uh, and you have to use 75% of it at a minimum for paying employees. The whole point being to keep Americans employed, keep, uh, keep small businesses running the, the foundation of our economy. Florida received 88997 of these paycheck protection loans uh, and for a total of $17.8 billion. So that's a lot of money that got out into the street in Florida very quickly, but there were problems, uh, many of them. One, we saw major banks front load tons of their largest clients. Um, you have to be 500 employees or less, but some folks fit in through loopholes as subsidiaries of larger companies. They front loaded these with sophisticated systems uh, filing a lot of these applications within the first couple of minutes. Um, and so we saw uh, not only a lot of the, the biggest small businesses uh, with the biggest banks get a lot of this funding, but uh, some that really accepted money in a kind of unsavory fashion, a lot of uh, national restaurant and hotel chains that many of them have returned the money because they have been shamed um, into doing so. And Treasury also came out with a, uh, regulation last week that if you can get money off of the, through the stock market or through bonds or other a, a access to capital markets, you will unlikely qualify for the certification that you need that loan. So uh, for companies that did take this loan, I believe they have another couple days. Uh, I think it's either the 8th or the 10th or, or, or somewhere around there to return this funding and they'll have no liability. They'll be deemed to have complied in good faith that they return these loans soon. Um, there were caps that Wells Fargo and Bank of America put in for $10 billion that really hurt a lot of the smallest businesses that do, uh, that do business with the biggest banks. Um, that was a tough combo. Uh, the $10 billion cap for Wells Fargo was put in because uh, of the penalties for the fraudulent bank account scheme they had a while back. Well, Bank of America put in a, uh, a self-imposed $10 billion cap. The good news is the Federal Reserve is buying a lot of these Paycheck Protection Program loans off of them to get those off the books so that they have more room in the caps. But uh, really, it's going to be the toughest for the smallest businesses going with the biggest banks um, because they're just not prioritizing the, the smallest banks or the smallest businesses. The good news is you may have heard last week we refunded, we replenished the program with another $310 billion for Paycheck Protection Program loans. Uh, including $60 billion set aside to have to go through community banks, credit unions, and mission-based financial institutions. Uh, this should help veteran-owned, women-owned, minority-owned um, businesses, um, many of whom were left behind, and small family farms, many of whom weren't, didn't qualify under the original act. Uh, so that $60 billion should go a lot longer of a way than, than the others. We wanted half of it uh, to be set aside for these institutions and for the smallest of businesses. Uh, 
Obviously, we're, nego we're negotiating. These are bipartisan deals, so that represents a compromise. Um, there's another $50 billion for disaster assistance loans. Those have been popular with a lot of folks because it's slightly less paperwork, um, but it is a loan, not a forgiven, uh, uh, not a forgivable loan like the Paycheck Protection Loan. And then there's $10 billion in new emergency grants. Uh, there are justice issues with these, uh, these suits, or with the, these programs as well. There's been a lawsuit recently filed because the SBA isn't complying with the $10 billion emergency grant language that requires them to turn these grants around in three days, according to the CARES Act. There are other class action lawsuits that have been filed already, as far as I can see it, in Maryland, New York, California, and Texas. I didn't see any in Florida yet. Uh, that are seeking preliminary injunctions to stop uh, some of these largest of businesses that got funding through the banks from getting funding or setting aside some of that funding. And then, of course, uh, claims for fraud, breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, negligence, and violations of various state deceptive trade practices statutes, all arising out of the theory that the bank gave pre large banks gave preferences to customers eligible for larger loans in order to obtain more lucrative fees. Uh, and also, uh, even though it wasn't reported in the paper, I suspect uh, it's the same old song. You know, if you're, a, if you're a small business that has 400 employees and qualifies, you have probably a far closer relationship with your banker or your credit union than a four person small business. Uh, so uh, I'm sure a lot of you will be sorting through those claims and I would imagine uh, um, FJA, AHA, and, and, our, and our local folks will be looking at potential um, class action suits here in Florida based upon those theories. Lastly, I want to talk about uh, the health response. Obviously, that's the most important. Um, we um, fought for $130 billion for hospitals. Uh, and the first tranche came in uh, three weeks ago where Florida's hospitals received $30 billion. Excuse me, $30 billion was the first tranche Florida's hospitals received $2.2 billion, rather, uh, to 22,000 providers. We just got the second tranche in this past Friday for $389 million for 637 providers, the hardest hit providers. And we fought in this last package, this uh, supplemental package that we voted on last week, for $75 billion more in hospital funding and $25 billion for testing and monitoring. We know the key to reopening the the economy is testing and monitoring and over the long term a vaccine. And so we have to continue to fund um, these, uh, these healthcare efforts and our first responders. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about the, as far as the CARES Act, the $150 billion in state and local stimulus funds. Florida should receive $12 billion in total for state and local stimulus funds. Eight billion of that uh, will go to the state of Florida in the form of uh, um, budget stabilization and specific state programs. This will be key to protect funding uh, for the judiciary and other key uh, Department of Juvenile Justice and other key justice programs that I know all of you care deeply about. Uh, and another nearly four billion will go to local governments. Uh, lastly, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the liability issues coming up, and then I want to turn to uh, our experts to talk in greater length on these issues, knowing that you all are following them closely. Um, we know that there's going to be a big concern over how to treat business liability for customers or guests contracting COVID-19. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Uh, there are good Samaritan laws in play right now, uh, as uh, we are uh, seeing a, a lot of folks uh, volunteering uh, for healthcare, and then Telehealth uh, presents an interesting set of uh, uh, new facts. As you may know, we ex greatly expanded telehealth, particularly for Medicare, uh, being that we've uh, shut down a lot of uh, uh, healthcare services at hospitals to be able to prepare for the COVID-19 uh, uh, treatment. And of course, there are lots of scams that we talked about already, um, everything from paycheck protection to stimulus checks to unemployment. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to go into hearing from uh, First, we're going to hear from Ms. Johnson of AAJ. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for being on the line. It'd be great to hear some of the great work that AAJ is doing and, uh, and how we can work together. Yeah, thank you for having us. And that was some, some great information. I will mention that our CEO, Linda Lipson, was able to jump on for a few minutes. Uh, she apologizes. She has a conflict and 
couldn't stay for the whole thing. But sure. she, she's busy. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Um, I'm just going to hit a few highlights at the federal level. You did mention, you did hit on something, Congressman, that is a big concern of ours, and I would just say immunity. Um, sure. Obviously, we fought immunity pretty hard in the in the cares, cares and COVID three, however you want to refer to that piece of legislation. Um, we were fighting against very broad provisions, like um, there was one about I think it was coming from House uh, Homeland Security Services that anything like any um, uh, energy, um, communications, transportation, any of those services that are under an executive directive are all of, all of a sudden immune from liability. That was considered in that legislation and obviously we fought to get any of those provisions out. Um, what they ended up with was a very limited volunteer healthcare professional immunity when you're acti acting within the scope of your license and it doesn't apply to reckless conduct or anyone that's under the influence of drugs. So that was sure. very narrow and obviously thanks to our friends in the house like Representative Soto pushing back on some of these more broad provisions because I'm sure, I'm sure he can uh, reiterate everything under the sun was floated at one time during the oh, yes. <laughs> it will be for one more round in oh case. yes yeah and then that's what i was going to go into like i think during the next round i think this is going to be the we're worried about med mal we're worried about premises liability for consumers contracting COVID and the, like businesses getting some kind of immunity we're also worried about employer immunity for their employees getting sick so we're going to need you again. <laughs> We're going to need you sure. and people like that to be stay strong in the House and um, do, deliver a strong message to the Senate that this kind of immunity is not necessary, not needed, and it's not a good idea. So in some of the, I'm glad you brought it up, uh, Bonnie, some of the key members uh, to keep in mind from Florida's delegation in the House uh, as we're navigating through these issues, we have our friends in judiciary, um, Val Demings, uh, Ted Deutsch, Debbie Merkel powell uh, Stuby and uh, Matt Gates are the Florida members. I believe that's that's all the Florida members on there. And then uh, in uh, in Energy and Commerce, uh, where I serve, we have the Consumer Protection Committee, which deals with products liability and uh, and every single aspect of business liability you can imagine under the sun when it comes to uh, these uh, product safety. Uh, so, uh, and we also have. Uh, uh, Kathy Castor serving that committee and Gus Bolarakis. So those are the folks in the house that you're going to want to uh, work with. And they're pretty much throughout a lot of the states. So different members in different geographies can play key roles in, uh, in working with them uh, to, to help out in these two key committees. Yeah. Um, we're, yeah, we're happy. To, we, we've been working with House Judiciary and House ENC and then to a certain extent, Ed and Labor for some of the employers. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, we um, we welcome your help help from your colleagues, and we'll push pretty hard. <laughs> sure. And a lot of this stuff, because unfortunately, even though I disagree with it, we're not having many committee meetings right now uh, out of fear of the COVID nineteen virus. So um, I wish we were, uh, to be frank. Um, so a lot of this stuff is uh, conference calls between members in the majority in the House, uh, uh, hashing these things out with our counterparts, uh, the Senate Republicans. So. Uh, it is, uh, it's less in the sunshine than I think it should be. And so all the more reason I'll be on those calls fighting for y'all. And, uh, and I've signed on to about a million letters to have Congress start doing telephonic teleconference hearings. So it's something that I feel really strongly about. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll be there, whether it's out in front or whether it's in a lot of these conference calls helping. Um, and thanks for your partnership, Bonnie, and, 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 our, and our allies at AAJ for your good work. Uh, yeah, because there's course, thank you. more thank stuff you. out there than I even know about. So you all are great to keep us informed on that. Yes, we'll keep you. I mean, that's part of the game. We'll keep you guys in the loop and we, we appreciate your support. Honestly, we couldn't do it without you. A strong message in the house. We're happy to work with y'all. We also have uh, from FJA, Paul Jess on the line, I believe is going to be uh, discussing uh, state issues. I saw, I heard maybe there's a brand new bill that maybe dropped uh, dealing with the business liability issue and the, uh, a whole host of other issues. So it'd be great to hear from you, Paul, about what you, uh, given your great experience in, uh, in the state legislature, what you, what you see are gonna be some of the hot issues. Well, thank you, Congressman. And, and first of all, let me thank you for having this Zoom meeting. We really appreciate it. Just like we really appreciate everything you do in Congress and, and all the good work that, that you do, both uh, in committees, behind the scenes, because, uh, you know, having, uh, having, 
had the pleasure of lobbying you for many years. Uh, you know, and by the way, we still miss your smiling face in the Florida Senate, uh, as, well as, <laughs> as well as Ted Deutsch and, and uh, many of the other folks that uh, you mentioned previously. But, but uh, I, know, I know the good work that you're doing up there in D.C., so thank you so much for that, and thank you for doing this. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Florida Justice Association, we really appreciate it. Uh, I've got my president-elect, Eric Romano, is, uh, is uh, with us. Eric is uh, going to be president in two months. Uh, Congratulations. He's, he's coming in at, a, at a, obviously a very critical time in our history. And I know you know uh, Jeff Porter, our legislative and political director, who's on with us. We had Lori Briggs on for a while. Lori is with the Circe Denny Squirrel of Barnhart and Shipley firm in uh, sure. uh, Palm Beach. And uh, she's on our executive committee, but I guess she had to, there's Lori, she's still here. Yep. And, and obviously I'm familiar with working with both of them already uh, in both the state legislature and, and many, of, including Lori, has visited me up in- uh, I just shut my video off for a minute. Uh, if you want to give um, um, Mr. Romano an opportunity to say a few words too, Hang on. we're normal on this. How you doing? Sure. Uh, Eric, any, any, anything you'd like to add uh, as the incoming president? No, just reiterate what Paul said. I uh, really appreciate you doing this and the great work you're doing on behalf of all of us in D.C. and keeping us apprised of these issues that affect our clients. Um, but uh, this means a lot and appreciate you taking the time. You bet. And Lori, I didn't want to cut you off. You're about to, I think you're about to say something. Lori Briggs? I was just about to say, hi, Congressman. Thanks for having us on. You bet. I appreciate the information. My pleasure. So, Paul, what are we looking at uh, in your crystal ball right now about what we may be facing. Well, for, first of all, let me let me say, and some of this you probably know already um, because of your close contact that you stay with your district, as I know. Uh, but uh, things in the court system in Florida are actually not that bad right now. Although trials are suspended, most judges are continuing to hold hearings uh, either telephonically or with Zoom. Uh, every single trial court in Florida is now Zoom capable. Uh, not all the judges are Zoom trained, but they're all Zoom capable. Uh, and so, uh, you know, other than the fact that trials are suspended and the phones are not ringing as much with uh, a lot less traffic on the roads, things are, you know, anecdotally what I'm hearing is things are going fairly smoothly. You know, get, have, as always, you have some uh, defendants who are dragging the, using the crisis to drag their feet, but they always find excuses to drag their feet. And are we seeing similar uh, smooth operations with the federal courts too uh, among among our members you know as far as i know yes uh, uh eric or Lori might be able to speak more to that but i know for example here in the northern district of florida uh the suit in regard to uh the voting rights uh you know the phone's voting rights suit that is going forward in fact i think it, they started a trial on that here yeah, this, uh, yesterday yeah they started this week it's we're all closely watching that yeah. So, so, you know, I think just anecdotally, things are going probably about as well as they can, given the crisis in terms of the court system. Uh, on the immunity issue that, that you were talking about and that AAJ, I know, is doing such good work fighting on the federal level, we've got the same problem here on the state level. As you're probably aware, uh, a group of associations, uh, including the Tort Reform Institute and the Florida Medical Association and others, uh, sent a letter some time ago to uh, Governor DeSantis asking for an executive order to grant them immunity. Uh, the nursing home association separately sent a separate letter asking for very broad immunity. And we're starting to hear rumors now that the Chamber of Commerce, uh, on behalf of just businesses generally, uh, are looking for immunity before they start back up, which is the, uh, the Brandis legislation that you're referring to, Senator Jeff Brandis, uh, who has never met a tort reform that he didn't like, is, uh, is told the papers that he's currently working on legislation to grant a broad immunity to businesses generally uh, in Florida. Uh, the good news is that, number one, not only has Governor DeSantis not acted on any of this, but we don't think he's got the authority under the Florida Constitution to grant immunity. And he probably knows that. He's, you know, uh, whether you agree with his social policies or other policies or not. He is a smart lawyer. I've had conversations with him and he's a very, very sharp lawyer and he probably knows his constitutional limitations. Uh, 
However, the he's he's obviously very well educated. I got to serve with him for two years uh, before he became governor, so we got to work on some issues. Uh, I I would hope he will stick to the training that he learned uh, rather than getting persuaded um, by outside means. Uh, but so far, so good. Right, exactly. And you know, the much more serious threat is. Uh, legislation, because clearly the legislature would have the ability to grant all these immunities that are being requested. Uh, as of right now, there is no special session scheduled. Um, you know, President Galvano, Senate President Galvano says that uh, he doesn't see a need for a special session. Uh, uh, however, there's a lot of anticipation that come fall that depending on how the uh, finances of the state work out in this crisis, that there may be a need for a special session to address uh, uh, budget uh, limitations in the Florida budget. So we'll just have to wait and see about that. In the meantime, this we're presents a, Go ahead. This presents an interesting set of allies because you have Republican leaders who don't want to go back to special session because anything can happen. And you have uh, justice advocates across the state, including FJA, uh, that don't want to go back into session because then it's all, it's all, all bets are off. So uh, with 8 billion coming to them, um, over 4 billion uh, for budget stabilization, although I've heard there's some uh, concern about how much flexibility is there, which uh, we're gonna work to give them as much flexibility as possible. But in addition, another three plus billion for specific state programs, that's 7 billion they could draw down, uh, giving you you may recall we were able to pull down about three to five billion a year from 2008 to I think about 2011, uh, which we still had some special sessions, but it started to spare us those as we go forward. So uh, anything we could do to help make sure the state can uh, be able to uh, keep their budget flowing smoothly, I think, is in a lot of people's interest. Absolutely. Without needing and, and thank you for that. And just uh, again, to let you know what we're doing right now regarding these requests for immunities, we're working mainly behind the scenes. We purposefully did not want to go uh, in, in a big public fashion uh, opposing this when the Florida Medical Association and the uh, Healthcare Association, the nursing home group, uh, you know, went very public asking for this immunity. We didn't want to counter that publicly because we didn't want this to turn into a media circus of doctors versus trial lawyers, you know, frontline COVID fighters versus trial lawyers. So we've been working behind the scenes to let leaders in the state of Florida know about all the immunities that they currently have under current law, including, as you know, under the federal acts, there are uh, various immunities. Uh, the uh, uh, secretary of HHS has, uh, you know, has, has, I think back in February 2020, uh, issued a rule that uh, that implicates some immunities that were built into a prior statute that came out during the SARS crisis. In addition, as you know, under Florida state law, there's lots of immunity for healthcare providers. It's even under normal times, it's extremely difficult to sue a healthcare provider in Florida, as you know. So sure. we're reminding leaders of all these immunities that they already have and that they don't need any more. Uh, this new uh, variant where Every single business wants immunity, presumably for everything. Uh, that's something that we're just going to have to see what it is that they're asking for, because right now it's, it's very unclear, uh, and, and start fighting that, uh, you know, behind the scenes or in front of the scenes, however we can fight it, just like AAJ is doing on the federal level. So that's pretty much what we're seeing right now here in Florida and what's going on. Again, I'm cautiously optimistic that Governor DeSantis is not going to do something, you know, either crazy or something that he knows he doesn't have the authority to do, uh, but we'll have to wait and see about that. Uh, I would be remiss while I've got the podium, so to speak, if I didn't make one request of you. Sure. Uh, and that is on behalf of our association, the Florida Justice Association itself. Uh, as you are probably aware, associations 501c6 entities under federal tax law that are all trade associations like the FJA, like AAJ, like the CF, uh, you know, Central Florida Trial Lawyers. We were left out of both iterations of the CARES Act. We can't get those CARES Act loans. Uh, I understand that there is going to be some effort to include associations 
in what we hope will be the next iteration. So I guess my request would be that in the next iteration, please avoid immunity, but please add some CARES Act <laughs> for associations. Sure, we're very supportive of that. It includes various advocacy organizations. That's one where you all and the nursing homes, the chamber and the FMA can all, can all sign up together in a kumbaya, a rare kumbaya. Yeah, we're obviously- Yeah. AJ reiterates that we obviously were left out of the C6 and yeah, I think there's a lot of us interested in getting that fixed the next go around. Sure, uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. And we'll, we're, we're certainly supportive of it. I've already signed on to uh, letters in support of it. If there's any bills that I haven't signed on to yet, please bring them to my attention. I'd appreciate it and we'll, we'll sign on to them. But uh, we, we know that these advocacy organizations are critical to uh, our civic, uh, uh, in democratic system, so we, we, we want to include you all in there, uh, certainly in the next go around. Um, thanks for that, uh, Paul, and uh, next we're going to go to my longtime friend, Jeremiah Jaspon. Uh, thanks uh, for being on the call, buddy, and uh, sure. it'd be great to, great to hear what we're seeing on locals' perspective, and uh, I'm going to make a, a pitch. Jeremiah and his family got to come up to get a tour of the Capitol, um, and uh, I encourage some of our members to consider coming up. Uh, you know, I can't think of a more patriotic, civic-minded group of individuals than uh, members of FJA, AHA, and our local trial bar. So uh, as you get the opportunity, we're honored to host you. Jeremiah, the floor is yours. Thanks for being All here. Right. Cole. Congressman, thank you uh, for being so gracious to my family. It was amazing to uh, walk in that Capitol building and to basically have it be empty that weekend. And uh, to be able to have that to ourselves almost was just amazing. So thank you. My honor. It was awesome. All right, my kids, I'm not sure if they're going to remember it. They're uh, 7 and 10 at the time. So hopefully they'll look back on that one day. So we got some photos, I'm sure. So we'll, you can remind them. I will. We have pictures. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to say before I get into local stuff that, um, you know, I'm a small firm. And I've got two paralegals. I'm a solo practitioner. And um, I, I'd like to report that the PPP has been very successful with firms like mine. And so, Great. you know, it, it's been really good for us. I've, I know there are some people who have had trouble. You know, personally, I did, I went through a small bank and they were fantastic. Did and, you get uh, the fund in the first round or was it on the second round? You know, I, I, they said yes. They said yes, that I got it, um, that I was approved for it before the end of the first round. But the money didn't oh. come until like right around the second round. So I'm not sure if that was first or second. You got approved oh. in the first round. That's, that's great to hear. Um, we, we, your business is the type of business we intended for these funds to go to. Those three to 100, 200 employees, smaller businesses. It goes up to 500 because of the SBA. But uh, we're really great to hear that. It'd be great if you all wouldn't mind doing a survey among your members to see how uh, – uh, both locally in Central Florida and throughout the state, uh, you all have fared on the PPP loans. Um, it'd be helpful for input for our office to make sure uh, that that we're 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 helping you all during this difficult time. Yep, I, I'd be happy to do that, and um, I can get those numbers to you once we do that. Um, you know, we had a webinar recently, the Central Florida Trial Lawyers Association. We had a webinar, and uh, we had the chief judge here in the Ninth Circuit, uh, Donald Myers, who's phenomenal jurist sure and um, times yeah he's awesome and you know he's been great and so we we uh, a lot of our members got to ask him questions you know our our biggest concern here in central florida is access to the courts because um there's been a, a problem with funding and, and i agree with uh with paul jess who's a great guy by the way um that you know, we are still having hearings. We are still having telephonic conferences and Zoom meetings and those kinds of things. But even prior to COVID-19, we were having trouble with getting our, our cases to trial. I mean, there is such a backlog of, of cases here in Central Florida, specifically Orlando, um, that even on a good day, you're waiting. If you do a notice of trial, you're still waiting a year to get in, in a courtroom. Yeah. And that's been made even worse now because... I mean, I had, a, I had two cases set for trial this May, and now they're bumped to 2021. Not only two. that, go ahead. No, please continue. 
Not only that, so you have this backlog of trials that we're going to have to deal with, which we already did not have enough judges to contend with before COVID-19. Um, what we're going to see play in as these cases come back in and we start trying cases is the civil case is going to be put to the back of the line because you have all these speedy trial issues with all these criminal cases that need to be tried. They're going to have to take the civil bench to try these speedy trial cases. And so it's, it's going to be a mess. And, and so our, our biggest concern, I was very heartened to hear you talk about there's what, eight, $8 billion coming in. Um, and for, for me here in central Florida, I'd love to see some more judges be, be hired immediately to contend with this issue because it's a major issue. And these insurance companies are going to take full advantage of it. Just like they're trying to take advantage of, you know, never waste an emergency. They're trying to take advantage of it with the legislation they're proposing in Tallahassee. Well, that trickles down to a local level because now these insurance companies know they don't have to pay up. They can just sit on that money. And, and what, meanwhile, our clients who have been injured uh, have to wait even longer. And it's an injustice. And so, you know, our, our biggest concern here, we have, we have other concerns, but that's really our main concern is making sure we have enough judges to contend with the issues that we have to have. And, and, and moving forward, we need more funding for them anyway. So, um, just to respond to that, because you bring up an excellent point, and this is why we're bringing federal, state, and local all together, because there are issues we can work in concert for. Uh, we are going to be debating in CARES 2 another round of funding for state and local governments. It's one of the big fights right now. I suspect we'll get some, um, but uh, it won't be as much as we want, but it's a compromise during a crisis, obviously. Um, first, through the $8 billion already allocated, uh, there may be an effort on the state level to be able to argue that there are two um, big areas of COVID response funding that the court needs help with. One is technology, and two is enough judges. Even if it's bringing back uh, some of the senior judges to handle some of these cases, uh, they, that may be two great areas in the budget that you all can fight for because those are clearly COVID response related. Technology like Zoom and all these other things that courts are using, and of course, the dealing with the backlog. And in the state budget, you can, I believe we have the authority under the state level to designate a certain amount for civil cases versus criminal versus uh, other cases. So uh, Paul, what do, what do you think about that on a, on a on a state level, and then I'm going to turn to Bonnie about efforts for the next round on CARES 2. Do you think that those are two initiatives we may be able to work on to help out with um, the, this caseload issue? I, I think that would be great if there were, were a way to earmark the money for, uh, for civil. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I've never done enough research or lobbying on the, uh, on the budget side of things to know under current state law, if, uh, if they're able to do that, I assume so. I, I assume that currently the state legislature could, by proviso, designate how much of the money went where, but, you know, I, I just don't know. But that would be tremendously helpful if it could be earmarked in that way. Well, I would strongly encourage FJA to look at uh, the technology funding and the, uh, the number of judges, even if we, because we fight every year to get more judges, judicial slots approved, everybody's well aware of that long-term term battle. But even if we could get some senior judges in on a one-year basis, six-month, two-year basis, uh, funded by a specific line item, that would be a big help uh, to make sure the inevitable backlog that uh, Jeremiah is talking about, uh, we could get movement on that. And I want to turn to Bonnie next, you know, we're going into this big fight for CARES 2, where we're trying to get more funding uh, for state and local governments. Uh, so is this something you think AAJ can help us work on to see if we can designate a certain amount of that care funding for state and local governments to go to the judiciary to handle this type of backlog? Yes. Um, yeah, AAJ would be interested in that. And uh, as a side note, we're also working with House Judiciary um, to do like sort of a courts package to kind of help the federal courts improve technology. I know the first go around, the courts asked for like only $6 million, which is painfully inadequate for what they like, what they need to like re-equip those courtrooms for technology. So we're looking, we definitely want to do a 
like a big push for more funding for the courts at federal and state level. If it would be great, Bonnie, if you could help me put together a, a letter on both federal court funding and setting aside funding for state and local governments under CARES too to help fund uh, our state courts as well, particularly uh, the backlogs and in, in civil, uh, as well as the technology upgrades. Uh, you think that's something that you can help us put together? Yep, we'll be in touch. I appreciate that. Um, Paul, yes. And then yeah, we'll if back. I could uh, just jump in one more time, sure. Congressman, to let you know, uh, on the on the state level here in terms of the courts, uh, I had a great conversation with Chief Justice uh, Kennedy just prior to his most recent round of orders. Uh, and although I don't agree with most of his <laughs> opinions on uh, tort and insurance issues, but I can tell you that on the issue of keeping the courts open and moving and, and getting trials going again, he's, he's all over that. And although he recognizes that we are going to have to put a uh, priority on the criminal cases once we get cranked back up again for speedy trial purposes. But he is not uh, inclined to just let civil go to the back burner. Uh, he, he wants to move forward on the civil trials too. He's much more concerned about the general backlog of cases. I mean, that's his focus as the chief administrative officer of the courts is, is that. And I know uh, I've had conversations with Lisa Keel, who's the state court administrator, uh, about specifically uh, senior judges. And they're hopeful that they're going to be able to get, uh, use uh, a lot of the funding that they have in the current budget uh, to bring senior judges back in to do trials once trials crank back up again. That's great to hear. We often see that, I mean, we all know Justice Delayed, Justice Denied, we all familiar with uh, with that principle, uh, but often a lot of these issues are just that the courts are so woefully underfunded that uh, that it, it it's forced to cannibalize upon itself to prioritize criminal and then put civil on the back burner. So uh, I'd strongly encourage you all to fight for a line item uh, for civil backlog, and we will work on the federal level to maybe just get those funds designated that way to begin with uh, to help you in your battle on the state level. Uh, knowing that the state would only be able to draw those down uh, for those purposes. So uh, thanks, everybody. I'm going to continue to give uh, Jeremiah now the floor, uh, and thanks for bringing that issue up. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I really don't know how I have much more to add than what, what Paul just said. I mean, um, a lot of this work has to be done, done up in Tallahassee uh, for, for those funds. And, you know, Paul Jess and Jeff Porter are the guys up there uh, to, to get that done. But, you know, it's also interesting that they, uh, I think Ms. Johnston was talking about uh, money for technology. I was talking, to, when we were talking to Judge Myers, we were talking about, you know, this situation has caused us to reevaluate how we practice law. In other words, why, why do we need to even go to court for a pretrial conference? Why can't we just appear via Zoom or, or telephonically moving forward? We can all be more productive sitting in our offices and, and working that way and and the judge was even talking about um, maybe doing a trial by Zoom where the jury is there virtually, the witnesses appear, everybody's virtual. Um, so this is bringing up a new world for us, even after there's a vaccine that, you know, changes our foot here and just making sure there's the money uh, for that technology in the courtrooms, if, if that's the way we are heading with this, because once we get back to our quote unquote new normal, are, we, are jurors gonna really wanna show up and be you know, shoulder to shoulder um, with you know, the hysteria that's gonna continue on even after this is, you know, after there's you know, medication or whatever to, to treat it. So, I mean, part of the fear is that we're not gonna be able to have enough uh, jury for, for proper voir dire and be able to, to seat a, a jury. Um, and so these are all things that you, you all folks are going to have to figure out and, and, and finance. But these are the issues that we're having here locally that looking in our crystal ball are going to start arising down the road as well as we start trying cases. Well, that's great feedback. And we should probably add that into the letter we'll work with on the federal level is that's a part of technology is everything from hearings to jury, uh, seating a jury and uh, and then setting aside some for civil 
Um, if we can get language that sets aside some of this funding for that, that goes to state and local governments, uh, that'll help every state justice association uh, be in a much stronger position. And right now, with uh, they're probably needing another one last long term recovery package that'll be passed by the end of May, which will to early June in all likelihood that we refer to as CARES too. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to really uh, get at these issues. Um, and the key is we wanna put in some guidance, but not put in, make it overly restrictive where then we're telling states and local governments what to do. So I think the key will be um, giving them the money for technology, giving them some guidance, but really letting this stuff be worked out uh, on the state level with the idea that uh, segment and now some for civil may give you all a, a big boost on uh, knowing that otherwise they'll just put in a little bit of money and uh, it'll, most of it will go to the criminal court based on constitutional issues. So I appreciate you bringing those things up and certainly we, we will look forward to pursuing those reforms on the federal level too um, because uh, you know we're seeing grand juries and juries and uh, still all the time, not right now, but um, before the crisis. So and we're seeing this across many industries, the, the changes that are happening as a result of uh, having to adapt. So I appreciate that suggestion. With there, we have a few more minutes to take questions. I know our FJA, uh, 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 I know Paul and, and Jeff have to, have to go on a conference call, so feel free. Um, we're going to stick around for a few questions from those who are on the line who, uh, who uh, have questions from beyond that. So. Uh, Christine or Shayla, whoever's running this one, uh, can you, let's start with questions from, um, from those attending. Thanks. Hey, Congressman, thank you for everything. So good thank to see you and look forward to seeing you in the flesh soon. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much for your leadership. We're, we're really proud to call you a friend. You're uh, leading through very difficult times right now and we appreciate everything you are looking out for us with. Well, it's my pleasure and thanks for your input um, because we yep. certainly, when we get elected to Congress, despite what people think, we don't know everything. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the feedback from all of you that really help us get on the same page for some of these great ideas like uh, these ideas related to uh, helping the court's budget and the, and the caseloads that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll back up. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to stick right. on the line. Thank you. Jeremiah, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you all thank for everything you do. Good to see you, bud. Bye. Christine, who do I have as our first question? Shayla? Currently, Shayla. Yeah. Currently, we don't have any questions that people have sent in through Zoom chat. A lot of the people today have actually logged on by Zoom video. So okay. if you have a question, please unmute yourself by pressing the unmute button on the top right hand corner of your screen and, and just go ahead. If not, you can always send me a question typed up on Zoom chat on the bottom portion of your screen. And we have a few minutes for questions. So please, anybody who has a question, this is very informal. Um, we, we encourage you to do so. And it's the top right button to unmute yourself <laughs> for anybody searching for that. Nothing's been sent to me on Zoom chat so far. Okay. Well, I know you're all busy, so I'm not gonna um, belabor or waste any other time. Hopefully you found this all informative. Uh, our, uh, the voices in our justice community, our, our attorneys from across the state are really valuable. And as you can see, there's a couple issues that we, we identified we could work on today with AAJ to help out uh, with our state and local partners. So uh, we appreciate that input. This is an ongoing conversation, so please feel free to send me uh, additional info or, or issues that come up. And uh, uh, especially on the access to courts issues, the liability issues, the paycheck protection program issues, I know those all affect you all directly and then your clients will be affected quite a bit by unemployment potentially or the stimulus payments on top of that. So uh, we're here to help you. Uh, this is a long time relationship. We will continue uh, to, to appreciate and uh, keep great communication. So everybody be safe, be healthy. I wish the best of fortune to your businesses uh, in this difficult time and, uh, and God bless you all. Uh, this concludes our Thank you, Congressman. Thanks, Have Jeremiah. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you so much.